Great. Why don't we go ahead and get started? I know um, people are still joining, so um, we'll try to go slow in the beginning so you get all of the, the good information in about uh, five minutes. But I just wanted to give you all an overview of what we'll be discussing today. Um, welcome, first of all, to our first principal interest webinar for Market Links. My name is Sashi Jayatilika, and I'm the team lead for our development finance work stream for the PSE team, and I'll be your host today. Um, we're trying out a new format, which is why I think some of us might be having some technical issues. So please do feel free to use the chat box if you're having any issues. Um, but please note that we've muted all participants, um, and we'd encourage you to start off by picking the polls that we have listed on the side. Um, and for those just joining, feel free to introduce yourself on the chat box. And finally, um, you'll see Haley and Evan are on the chat box as the presenters. If you're having any issues with um, technical sound or whatever, please message them or send a message in the chat box to all of us because we have had some challenges in the past when there's over 100 people on, but it looks like we're okay for now. Um, and finally, if there's any questions that we don't get to in today's discussion, please, please feel free to email us at globalpartnerships at USAID.gov. We'll put that on the chat box as well. And lastly, we will be recording today's call and it will be uploaded on market links. So if there are colleagues of yours that could not join today that would like to join um, and listen, please feel free to send them the link once it's uploaded. Let's get started. So today's um, discussion will be focus on, focusing on the evolution of how we use finance in agriculture. I think we've come a long way from the Green Revolution in how we've um, innovated how to support smallholder farmers and those actors in the value chain from the top to the bottom. And today we'll be talking a little bit about how to measure the impact around capital mobilized for farmers, and value chain actors in agriculture. And we'll also be discussing the different ways that USAID has supported some blended finance approaches in agricultural finance. And don't worry if you're not familiar with some of the terminology, we'll plan to try to uh, define that. And if you have any questions on anything that we're talking about today, please do feel free to um, ask us on the chat box. With that, um, let me introduce our agriculture finance team lead who will be our moderator today, Songbei Li. Um, welcome, Songbei. I just wanted to make sure we can hear you now. Hi, Sashi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, maybe uh, you can give us a little overview about what we can look forward to in the Market Links community on how Feed the Future and USAID are approaching finance in the agriculture sector. Sure, great. Thanks, Sashi. So, you know, just to start out with some, some background, um, SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, you know, they comprise about um, over 60% of agricultural, um, sorry, over 60% of agricultural production and trade in Africa, but they face an annual financing gap of $65 billion. In addition, in East Africa, over 60% of the population depends on agriculture as their primary source of livelihood, but the sector only uh, accounts for about 5% of all commercial bank lending. So we know we need to address this financing gap in order to generate economic growth in these countries and that the problem is too large for USA to solve by ourselves. So we partner with the private sector to build scalable solutions. Uh, I joined USAID a few months ago and I've been really um, trying to learn about the programs you support. And today, uh, these are two of the most innovative programs uh, I've come across. And I, I think it's really interesting to present them together because they both have similarities about using uh, technical assistance and incentives in their approach, uh, but they also have differences in their design and funding. Great. Um, thank you, Sangbei. Um, it sounds like we'll be discussing this blended finance approach. And just to clarify for everyone, we have discussed this before in Market Links, um, and there's a webinar from March that you can refer to with our colleagues from Invest, where we discuss how to, what blended finance is and how to use it in um, development. Um, but essentially, it's the public, it's the use of public or philanthropic resources, um, also referred to as catalytic capital. 
to increase private sector investment in sustainable development. Um, I was wondering, Songwei, if you can tell us more about how we would evaluate uh, blended finance in this case, um, as well as the, when we use it with commercial orientation and when it doesn't require um, donor funding. Uh, thanks for that question, Sashi. So um, I think these are also two really good cases to talk about when we're thinking about the allocation of scarce donor dollars. Before I joined USAID, I worked a lot in, in microfinance, and we know that originally the story was that if we provided uh, poor people loans, we could lift them out of poverty. But then there was um, some rigorous research and helped us understand that the, the impact of microfinance is much more nuanced. So in these cases, a lot of the, um, when we describe the impact, we start talking about leveraged, the leveraged um, capital that these programs bring. But as donors and development um, practitioners, we also understand we need to talk a lot more about the impact that that capital, additional capital will have and how we can build an evidence base to measure that. So I'm going to transition to the next, next segment now. Um, a little background on USAID's work in, um, in mobilizing finance. A lot, a lot of people know USAID's guarantee product, which helped encourage uh, more capital into, in, into development. And then more recently, we've been financing or involved with funds that use a blended finance approach to crowd in uh, more commercially oriented capital. And the, what we're talking about today, I consider the next step in the evolution of innovative finance, and that is the use of incentives to change behavior with the market actors, investors, and, and other market actors. So what I'm hoping um, that participants will get from today's webinar are three things. First, I, I hope you'll learn more about the work Aseli Africa and the Kenya Investment Mechanism are doing so that you can take any lessons uh, learned and any components of their program when you consider the design of your own programs. Second, I hope you'll understand better the challenges that they face when they're working with both donors and private investors, and then help maybe discuss together ways that we can improve or overcome those challenges. And finally, and most importantly, I really do hope that we can think, beyond, think more about the impact beyond just the capital mobilized and how we might be able to both, um, to what that impact should be and how we might be able to measure it. Measure it. So now I'm going to ask um, Brian and Amanda to both give a short overview of their programs. Uh, we'll start with Brian, who is the founder and CEO of Aseli Africa. He is also the co-founder and director for the Council on Smallholder Agricultural Finance, uh, CSAF, and previously he worked for over 10 years as the Chief Innovation Officer for Root Capital. Uh, Brian, Aseli launched just this year, but has been years in the making. I was wondering if you could share with us uh, the problem you were trying to solve and how you approached it. Yeah, th thanks, Sangbei and Sashi, for the invitation to present today. So, Aseli Africa is trying to solve the financing gap for agricultural SMEs uh, in East Africa. And we're focused on enterprises that have revenues of at least $50,000 and financing needs of 25,000 up to 1.5 million. So it's a very specific segment that we're targeting. These are businesses like agro dealers that supply inputs to smallholders, they're cooperatives that link smallholders to markets. They're, um, they work in post-harvest handling, storage, uh, processing, uh, creating jobs along the value chain. And they have the potential to create pathways out of poverty for farmers and workers and to reduce Africa's reliance on expensive food imports. But we also know that roughly three in four of them lack reliable access to finance. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Sangbei, I began working on this problem uh, about 15 years ago with Root Capital, uh, which is an impact lender serving agricultural SMEs in Africa, Latin America. And for as long as I've been in the sector, and I've imagined going back much farther, the debates have been around, is risk in agriculture real or perceived uh, from a lender perspective? And the thing is, these were debates that, that were never grounded in data. And, um, and so we decided to, to tackle that. And in 2018, uh, Root Capital and other members of CTAF, um, which is an industry alliance of 15 impact lenders serving agricultural SMEs, uh, began uh, part partnering with Dahlberg Advisors, and USAID provided funding support for this. Uh, we gathered one-level portfolio-level data from the CSAF members at a, uh, globally, 
and then focused in East Africa on banks and non-bank financial institutions. And you can see the logos from those institutions here. Um, so in total, about 31 lenders, over 9,000 transactions, close to $4 billion worth of lending to agricultural SMEs. And we found two things. Uh, number one, risk is at least twice as high in agri SME lending as in other sectors. And the second is that returns are four to five percent lower um, and actually slightly negative for lenders uh, serving this market segment. Um, and this is the case even for impact investors that have below market um, cost of capital. Um, so we have a status quo where the cost are higher than the revenues and only a trickle of capital flows to agricultural SMEs. And over the years, donors have gravitated towards uh, credit guarantees as a solution to, to share risk with lenders. Uh, but what this data tells us is that those guarantees, which are usually structured as the 50% risk sharing on a loan by loan basis, only address about one quarter of the financing gap. And so, a South Africa's approach is relatively simple in concept. Uh, we plan to use subsidy smartly to rebalance this equation. We want to add impact into onto the scale. And this approach is not all that different from what middle and high income countries around the world do to stimulate investment in strategic sectors of their economy. And when it comes to the most marginalized sector in low-income countries, we think that um, it's less an issue of whether to provide financial incentives to the private sector, but rather how to target those incentives in ways that promote competition, that generate measurable direct impact, and that reduce the need for subsidy in the future. So, Tele Africa launched a couple months ago in September uh, in Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, in Tanzania, and we aim to do three things. The first is to increase money to agricultural SMEs. We're not going to do any loans ourselves. We work through partners like the, the ones um, uh, that contributed data uh, to the project. Um, so our first offering is a portfolio first loss cover. It's designed to increase lenders' risk appetite beyond traditional loan guarantees. And the second is an origination incentive that compensates lenders for the additional costs um, to serve smaller loans and less developed value chains. And these are loans that tend to be unprofitable even when they're repaid. And one reason why we believe that loan guarantees aren't enough. Um, so given limited time, I'm not going to go into detail on these, but there is much more information on the Aceli Africa website. And I'm also happy to, to answer questions in the chat or ask the call. Every loan supported by Aceli must deliver impact on farmer and worker livelihoods uh, to qualify for either of these incentives. And then we set up higher um, standards, impact standards, and provided impact bonus for loans that are gender inclusive, that promote food security and nutrition within Africa, as opposed to say a cash crop like coffee that's being exported. Um, as well as for climate smart and resilient agriculture. We're working with about 20 lenders across East Africa to start. Uh, two thirds of these are commercial banks and non-bank lenders domiciled in East Africa. The remaining uh, third are international social lenders like Group Capital. Um, the second thing we do is we aim to expand the addressable demand so that more agricultural SMEs are prepared to qualify for and manage financing. And there are already a lot of TA models in the market. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. Our aim is to facilitate improved coordination between the TA and financing. And also, now that lenders have these financial incentives, uh, connect them to businesses that they're more motivated and able to, to serve um, at the end of uh, the TA process. Um, and lastly, we're developing capacity building for lenders. Uh, the financial incentives we believe are critical but uh, lenders also need to adapt their product offering, their processes to the agri SME market. So in combination, the, the financial incentives and TA, uh, we aim to mobilize 700 million in financing for agri SMEs across 
the, the four East African countries by 2025. And our belief is that the market is going to become more competitive and efficient so that financial incentives can be lowered over time. But we also expect that some parts of the market will require ongoing support. So over the next five years, we aim to build the evidence base and convince African governments that supporting agri-SME finance is a smart investment in their economic growth. And this will allow for an exit for international donors over a five to 10 year horizon. We've learned a lot in the data gathering and setup phase, and this learning is synthesized on a report uh, that you can also find on our website, but just a few takeaways here. Uh, the first is it takes time to build relationships with lenders uh, to shift their behavior. We expect this to be a multi-year process. The second, um, there's no silver bullet solutions. So yes, we're using data to offer financial incentives, but we think that um, interventions are needed on the capital supply and demand side. It must be paired with um, a stronger enabling environment and really building off of all the work that USAID and its partners and many others have done to develop value chains and more formal SMEs. Um, and then third, and Songbei alluded to this in the opener, capital leverage is a relevant metric. It's certainly a measurable one, but we believe at Aselli that blended finance um, initiatives should be judged, uh, number one, on the additionality of capital that is mobilized directly, Number two, on longer term shifts in the capital markets that follow, and ultimately three, on the incremental social environmental impact that's generated from this capital additionality and these market shifts. And these are much harder to measure, but if practitioners and donors don't push each other to answer these questions, then we're not going to know what's been effective. And we're not going to be able to improve our solutions over time. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. There, there's a lot there, so I will just emphasize um, there is a lot more on their website. They have a, for anyone who's really interested in the deep dive, a 50 plus page deck uh, that goes through um, in a lot of detail the things that he's covered. So thank you, Brian. So now I wanna um, head over to Amanda. Um, so Amanda Fernandez is the Economic Growth Director uh, for Palladium, uh, where she's been for the last five years, and she's had a, um, a lot of experience before Palladium, having worked at um, Piranha, USAID, uh, the uh, Annie E. Casey Foundation, and Catholic Relief Services. So Amanda was also very involved with a, a similar incentive program in Ghana called FinGap. So Amanda, I was wondering if you could tell us um, how you adapted the, the FinGap model to the Kenya context, and also we um, because Kim has already been in operation for a few years, uh, share with us the results so far. Great. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present. So first I have to say that uh, I work for Palladium. I've been here uh, for at least 10 years, uh, formerly with Piranha, which was purchased by Palladium. Uh, we're a global development firm. We have about 2,500 employees and we've been in the business for about 50 years. Uh, and what we try to do is help our clients uh, implement inclusive programs that have uh, enduring social, economic, and environmental impact and that's positive impact and that's our corporate ethos and everything we strive to do is that. Um, we have been uh, implementing market systems, transformation programs, and working with the private sector and financial institutions for decades when this opportunity came about in Kenya to design a program for USAID there. And uh, we had been implementing a, a program, you alluded to it, financing Ghanaian agriculture program, and it was really successful. So we thought that we could replicate this success and at least some of the strategies that we use in Ghana to Kenya. So back in 2016, this slide is relevant, um, we designed this program. And it was really, I guess, it, this was a contract. So it was in response to an RFP that the mission put out, laying out their requirements for their target sectors, uh, and, and what they wanted us to accomplish, which was essentially to help the Kenyan dynamic private sector access the financing that it needed uh, to bridge that financing gap that you alluded to earlier, not just in agriculture, but also in clean energy. So we tailored a set of strategies that uh, we had utilized previously and we had piloted, so we knew they worked, uh, to, and we set an ambitious financing target of $400 million that we wanted to uh, facilitate and close within five years of this program. 
The idea was that we would impact about 1,600 firms and 200,000 uh, rural families behind those. And also with Kim, and I think that this was mentioned in terms of impact, is you know we're really keen on making sure that our programs uh, actually achieve development impact <laughs> in addition to just getting money out the door. Uh, and in, most importantly, stimulating uh, inclusive growth across all segments of these supply chains and value chains. So we have hired out an impact assessment in Kenya to help us study that as we have in other places. So next slide. Uh, so what does our, our project team in Kenya do uh, managing this project? We essentially work in three work streams, and that's on the generating demand for financing, expanding the supply for financing, and then entering into strategic partnerships with large actors, mostly corporates, that have interesting business models that they need to sort of do proof of concept on in order to expand financing to many thousands of customers in more efficient ways and more cost effectively. The specific activities that we, that team in Kenya mostly um, implement has to do with uh, providing complex transaction assistance and then also building a market of local transaction advisors in Kenya so that they can actually find, structure, and close financing in collaboration with financial institutions. We also uh, provide training and technical assistance to financial institutions, provide smart incentives to those financial institutions to buy down their risk in uh, being able to lend to these sectors of interest. And, we, uh, and the team also works a lot on policy development uh, that is specifically targeted to unlocking financing along those supply chains. And then more, and then as I mentioned in strategic partnerships with corporate, so we have a lot of work there. What's, what is it all for? <laughs> Again, it's not just about $400 million. Um, it, that's really important, and Nate, of course, wants us to hit that target. But I, th I heard the mission director in Ghana say it the other day really well. She said, these are behavior change programs. These are programs, you know, not just to inject a lot of liquidity into a market, but to use these relatively small aid resources to transform financing markets so that lenders are lending differently, advisors are providing better services, companies are growing inclusively. That's really important. And if we design these programs right, we can achieve that in ways that continues to provide benefits moving forward. So next slide. What has Kim accomplished in its first two years of operation? It's a five-year program, and uh, we're well on our way to hit that $400 million target. Um, they've done $121 million uh, in financing released by the financial institution partners of that program. There's 17 that are involved in the uh, pay for results sort of uh, incentive program, but many more that receive training and support from the program. If you look on the left, that's the distribution of financing to the different sectors, most to horticulture. After that, uh, dairy and livestock. On the right, you'll see who and which kind of companies are benefiting most from that financing. What's interesting in this market is that the microfinance segment is, uh, is really benefiting the most from uh, these, this financing. Right now they have a pipeline of about $679 million. Uh, they're well on their way. So next slide. So here I want to kind of talk about what we're learning from these programs. And, and I think, um, you know, it's important to note that each market, the, these incentives have different impacts. Um, the incentives in Kenya, I think uh, we've seen that, that they're really working to uh, subsidize the transaction assistance, to provide financial institutions with training. All that stuff is working, the, the, the uh, incentives for financial institutions, but they're working differently than they did in Ghana, right? Uh, the microfinance institutions are really benefiting significantly from this program, more so than we had seen uh, in other markets. Um, and also across our global portfolio, more broadly, we're seeing that the main challenge is, you know, not necessarily the lack of availability of capital, but really in the identification and the structuring of the right types of opportunities uh, that are attractive to investors and bring benefits inclusively along that supply chain. We found lots of corporate actors that are really interested in, in, um, in, in modeling new financing programs and putting those on the street. Um, and doing that proof of concept because that's another way to get a lot of financing out to many smallholder farmers. Um, and I guess the point of all of this is to say that, you know, these incentives and strategies really do need to be tailored for the country context. 
Um, I'd be very, very concerned about just the cutting and pasting what we did in Ghana or what we did in Kenya to a different market without really thinking about um, whether or not those incentives will have the same effect. If you have a very heavy-handed government involved in ag financing, if you have a very limited BAS market for business advisory services, you may need to think very differently about how you structure these. Um, as Brian said, no silver bullets. <laughs> so on the things that we didn't count on in Kenya, I think you know, we had a number of shifts in scope uh, from the mission, and, and every time you have a, a shift in scope, that means you have to spend some time restructuring internally to um, operate differently. Um, the local BAS market is not as developed in Kenya, um, and, and it hasn't grown as quickly as the one that we saw in Ghana, but it's on its way, and, um, and that's really exciting. And then, of course, there was COVID. <laughs> we, hadn't, we didn't plan for that. And that has had an impact on uh, financial institution lending. And I think just the, the lenders in our network have um, reduced lending in the last quarter, if I'm not mistaken, about 34%. But we really haven't seen the impact on our targets and our results. We'll probably see more of that moving forward. So time check. Can I go to the, the last slide, uh, Songbei and others? Or should I wait here? Why don't we go ahead okay. and finish up your slide? Yeah. Okay, great. So, I mean, I think we've been reflecting lately as Palladium uh, on our global work in this space. We work all over the world uh, in using these kinds of incentives in different contexts uh, for donors and, and corporates uh, and many other actors. And I think, you know, a couple of things that I think are really important to think about. Um, one is that what we've seen in terms of farmer success is that the number one predictor of that is really their connection to the market and how strong that is. I think that plays out also in this COVID environment. The farmers that have been able to move forward are the ones that have had that really strong and, you know, important relationship. And so also a lot of farmers really struggle to be profitable, and a lot of that is not necessarily known. And so they need more than money. They need money, but they also need PA. And they also need that secure market. So these programs really do need to consider that sort of triangulated support to the farmers in order to really make these incentives work. And even I think, you know, with um, all of these success, successful programs, uh, you know, the, what did what did uh, Sanjay say? The financing gap was 65 billion dollars, <laughs> making a very small dent. Um, I'm really proud of what we've done, but we really need to think bolder. And I think there are different ways to do that, and that's thinking about how these interesting programs can remain, you know, blended finance facilities after these programs end so that you have something to continue uh, to leverage and fund capital and have impact uh, in much more um, uh, scalable ways uh, than we've been able to do to date. So Palladium's involved in doing a number of these in other markets. Brazil is one place. We're designing something really interesting and new in Peru. It has to do with not just financing, but environmental protection. So there's lots of different ways that these programs can be applied. I'll leave it there. Happy to answer whatever questions you have and um, provide other information as needed. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, that was great. Really appreciate it. Also, you know, Kim is, um, they do, they uh, have just released some results for the first two years, and there's also uh, a lot of information on FinGAP that um, the, the previous five-year uh, program that they did in Ghana, I encourage people to look at that as well, F-I-N-G-A-P, FinGAP. Um, so before I go into my questions, I just, just a couple, high-level comparison, because there was a lot of information there, you know, so one, you know, easy one is Kim is focused on one country, uh, Sally is focused on four countries, also the, the target this, the, um, the market segment that they're targeting, uh, thin gap in Ghana originally was only agriculture and it's expanded in, in, in Kenya to include um, clean energy, uh, whereas Aceli is, is still only on agri SMEs. And that's the third point I'll just comment on is, is the loan size. So uh, 
a CELI is very has a very narrow loan size that they're targeting. This twenty from twenty five thousand dollars to one point five million dollars. And whereas Kim has a much broader range, uh, Amanda mentioned that they work with microfinance institutions, MFIs, that might be giving loan sizes uh, under $1,000 likely. And they recently also announced the Kim transaction that was over $20 million. So they're taking a very, a very broad approach. So some things to keep in mind. The first question I'm going to ask for both of you is something that we have been discussing, but I think it's worth digging in a little deeper and focusing on it. And that's going back to the question of impact. So I think a lot of the um, a lot of the headlines that we usually hear, uh, which make good for good press releases, is the amount of capital mobilized. Uh, the, and the targets you guys both have are ambitious. Uh, Selly is targeting mobilizing 700 across four countries, and Kim uh, 400 million in one country. But we know that the impact we need to think about is what what kind of impact is being created by that mobilized capital. So what I'd like to just ask uh, both of you is to just, you, you mentioned in your, in your um, presentation, but I'll dig a little deeper in, you know, what are your criteria um, for impact and how do you see approaching measuring the impact that comes from that additional capital? In other words, how do we move beyond self-published evaluation reports to building a more rigorous evidence base to help us measure that impact? So um, Amanda, if I could ask you to go first. Yes, yeah, sure, no problem. A um, lot, lot to answer there. <laughs> but, it, you know, for us, it was really important, actually, to make sure. It, it dawned on me one morning, uh, I was overseeing the program in Ghana, that, oh, my God, what have we done? Have we just created the largest subprime uh, crisis in Ghana? I mean, by then, we were at about $200 million in, in capital. And I, and, and I had heard on a market links, actually, um, webinar at, at some point that somebody was questioning that finance could actually be helpful to a business growth. And I kind of want to prove that, <laughs> that there is an impact. So we, we, we went back and we designed with USAID uh, a impact assessment to look at fir farms, firms, the BAS environment, and also financial institutions. And we, and we looked very closely at their profits, uh, their social indicators at the very upstream, you know, are they eating more? Are the families, do the family's houses look better? Do they have access to electricity and, and concrete on their floors? Um, for the BAS providers, it's who are their clients? Are they making more money? Same with the, at every level, we're looking at profitability, we're looking at sales, and um, we're looking at growth and lending to the sectors that we see. All of that is written up very, in a very detailed fashion in a number of uh, studies that we have published, and the information is very interesting. But I thought, actually, that was all done in the five years of FinGAP. What really was interesting is what happened after. And that was something that I wasn't really anticipating. We had wanted to create a facility at the end of IMPACT, and my biggest regret was we weren't able to kind of close that for a number of reasons. It had to do less with the program, but just more about the context. <clears throat> and what we did two years later is we called up all of the, the top five financial institutions that we worked with and the top five BAS providers and just really quickly said, like, what are you up to these days and how have things changed in the two years since we left? And in every case, they were not only still lending uh, to finance, uh, to agriculture, and the, specifically those value chains that we worked in, um, but in some cases, they had continued to double their portfolios in agriculture. In Kingat, we looked at the financial institutions, they were lending 5% or something to add. By the time we finished that program, of the institutions that we worked with, they were up to 27% or 29% in, uh, in agriculture lending as a percentage of their overall portfolio. So it, it's continued to grow, and we hadn't anticipated that. No support from, from USAID. And the, the top uh, BAS providers were also very heavily involved still in the sector. So to us, that was very promising. I agree that we could be more scientific about the way that that data is collected. We're doing a similar uh, impact assessment in uh, Kenya uh, with a, a, a firm, a Kenyan firm there. And, and I think that some of the really interesting uh, impact is coming from places like, I think it's Acumen and the 60 decibels um, sort of mobile phone um, digital monitoring, I think that's really exciting. And that's something that we want to look into in a new program that we're implementing in Peru. 
Thank you, Amanda. That, uh, that's great that you guys went back after the program has ended and, and collected additional information. Um, Brian, do you want to take a shot at answering my long and broad question? Yeah, and before I do that, also, I think sometimes these benefits are not linear or not predictable. So a senior leader at Aseli Africa took over the Barclays Ghana portfolio in 2014 for agri, didn't have any agri background and was one of the beneficiaries of the FinGap capacity building in agri SME finance. And Barclays grew their portfolio tremendously under FinGap, and now um, he's, he's joined our team. So there, there are these um, ripple effects out from, from programs that, that take years and are really difficult to, to quantify, but we, we know it when we see it. In the case of the CELI, um, it's at three levels. So the first is around selection and uh, pre-screening. We require all the lenders that we work with to have environmental social governance policies and procedures. It might sound very basic, but a quarter of the lenders that we engaged did not have those policies, policies when we started working with them. And we've been supporting them to develop ESG policies and incorporate um, environmental social um, into their due diligence process. Um, and then we require that loans that are registered with the SELI also meet certain impact criteria. Businesses have to be sourcing from smallholders or creating a certain number of jobs. And then loans um, to businesses that are gender inclusive, that are contributing to food security or practicing climate smart resilient um, uh, practices are rewarded more. So there's this emphasis on steering lenders towards the areas that we already know to be higher impact. That's the first level. The second is then around monitoring, making sure that what we're seeing being reported to us is actually happening on the ground. So we do that through audits at the level of lenders as well as at the level of enterprises and farmers. Um, and we look at additionality, you know, it's, it's very tempting to say um, additionality is only measured by finance to a business that never previously accessed it. Certainly that's a high additionality loan, but additionality is also in incremental financing or different types of financing going to, to businesses that didn't previously have access or more flexible collateral requirements. And so that starts to get into kind of lots of gray areas around how to, how to measure that um, and, and something that, that we're working on so we can have comparison across the program. Um, and then for us, the third is, um, is around evaluation. And so we have this partnership with International Growth Center um, housed at London School of Economics. It's a third party kind of academic quality research. Um, SMEs are much harder to evaluate in many ways than microfinance. It's harder to run randomized control trials. Um, evaluation can take more time, be much more costly. Uh, so we have to get, get creative. And um, we've invested a lot in, in this partnership with International Growth Center. And we'd like to be contributing to the, the research uh, and knowledge base in the sector. Thank you, Brian. And I'll just say, you know, I think these are, I think one thing I want to emphasize is these questions, this question specifically, I think is, I would say, relevant for the, this audience and, and for Palladium, for Aceli, for Kenya Investment Mechanism. But I, I would also make a distinction a little bit between what we broadly call the general impact investing space, who are more focused on just um, getting the dollars out. If you're a fund, fund manager, you know, they have their investment strategy, they want to, uh, to achieve their deployment targets and, and grow their assets under management. So I think this topic is really the important one about impact is specifically when there's uh, donor, uh, donor money going in because that really does have a, a different, different goal that it's trying to accomplish beyond just mobilizing that capital, but the impact around that capital. The, the next question I'm gonna ask is also for both of you, and it's something that both of you have referenced and just to ask the question directly, and it's around the design and funding of both of your programs. For me, um, you know, coming in, I think I, I wouldn't have thought there was much difference, but it was, it's been really interesting as I understand both of your programs, kind of the origins and how that might have, how that might have impacted the work you're doing. So Aceli is a, is a nonprofit uh, that's supported by multiple donors and from USAID, it's, it's supported from the DC level. Uh, whereas, whereas the Kenya investment mechanism, it's, it's, as Amanda mentioned, it's a contract 
that is being implemented by Palladium and it's being funded completely by USAID through the mission in Kenya. So grants on one hand are very flexible. Uh, contracts can encourage um, accountability. Uh, if something is funded from USAID DC, it can fund a, a regional or global program, or if it's funded at the country level, then it's really gonna be tied to country specific strategic goals. So, so my question uh, again for both of you is how, some framing questions, how, how do we shift the contracts uh, focus on compliance and reporting to more uh, maximization, the flexibility of just maximizing developmental impact and building this evidence base that I keep coming back to. And, and second and related is how can we better coordinate the work that DC is supporting uh, with the work that's being done at the country level by missions? So um, this time I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to go first, Brian. Yeah, my best. Um, I think Amanda's much more experienced than I do around um, on the contracts. But, uh, you know, we, we set up a CELI in this way, and initially this was an, um, an effort by, by practitioners, by lenders that were trying to solve a problem in the market individually, recognizing that we were all facing the same challenges and then trying to work on solutions. Um, and it, it evolved from there when we gathered the data Etc. And so you know, we've designed the program in a way that, that we think responds to um, some of the, the most pressing challenges that we see. And we've enlisted USAID and other donors like IKEA Foundation and the Swiss Development Corporation as partners. Um, I think there probably is a lot more flexibility in some ways around the cooperative agreement we have with USAID. Certainly, there's a lot of accountability that I feel around uh, generating impact and, and how we do that. And we have a steering committee with our anchor funders uh, that, that provide a lot of input into the design of the program, the key performance indicators, and um, you know, we're just getting started. So we'll see how, how that unfolds. But, um, you know, I do think that there's a role for, for these types of initiatives um, to to happen, and of course, we want to be also well coordinated with with the missions, and not just the um, the missions, but also the implementing partners that are doing various value chain development programs, uh, because we want to be complementing and, and supporting um, their capacity building and steering financing to um, into those chains as well. Um, so I'm going to jump thanks, in Brian. because we've had a yeah. Oh. Maybe, maybe we'll jump in with some questions from the chat um, someday, and then just to mention that whatever we don't get to, we'll be able to um, answer by writing it up and it'll be on the webinar. Um, we only have about 15 minutes left and I wanted to make sure we have a chance to answer, um, verbally ask some of these questions that have come up. Um, one question that's been coming up um, in different forms is sustainability. And, and this question is really around uh, for for Amanda maybe first and then Brian, um, how you can how you see this approach on on business advisory services and pay for results as being sustainable after perhaps you can comment on the FinGap project because that's already ended, and whether SMEs and banks continue to to hire these providers afterwards and pay them, and then secondly to Brian afterwards if you can talk a little bit about what you think is sustainable in your model, especially in terms of the incentive bonuses, um, and if those continue, if, it's, if you've seen evidence so far. And then lastly, um, perhaps both of you can comment on the role of the local government in, in order to ensure that this sector continues to be um, supported by both the, the, the government policies as well, and perhaps what they can do in terms of subsidies. Okay, with that, Amanda. Great question. Um, so I mentioned in, 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 in Ghana that we, we went back and we saw that, you know, benefits had increased significantly. So I think Barclays, when we finished, when we started with Barclays, they were about 3 million in lending and ag. At the end of the program, they were about 60 million. Now they're about 100 million of, is their ag book within their broader portfolio. So it's growing. But as I mentioned, great. However, <laughs> the, the, the financing gap in Ghana for agriculture is at least $2 billion a year. So 
<laughs> I think that's fantastic. I think we need to open our eyes to what actually is, is possible. And I think, you know, what's important to mention is that the USA sort of contract structure is a little limiting in terms of being able to receive funding and blend financing from many other actors in sort of a facility. And an actor that we're not talking about enough in terms of its responsibility to ensuring um, that agriculture is successful for both businesses and farms are the, is the massive private sector uh, that is very concerned about making sure that um, its uh, suppliers are implementing practices that are going to be um, carbon neutral, uh, you know, supportive of the environment. And so they, they want to be involved in these programs. And they would like to be able to be involved in a number of different ways. <clears throat> so for us, kind of the next frontier in the structure of these programs is to create facilities where you can truly blend finance, not just from different donors um, or governments, but really bring in the private sector also as a critical actor because they're concerned about agriculture financing being successful for the future of their businesses. And also they're very concerned about the transparency in the production of all of that. And everything that we do uh, to facilitate finance and to provide technical assistance is really important for them. So I think, um, you know, these programs can be very, very impactful in terms of uh, leaving behind an ecosystem that is supportive to agriculture, but we can do so much more. Thanks, Amanda. Brian, do you want to take a stab at this? Yeah, on the sustainability issues. So in the United States, we have an entire state government and federal government apparatus to support lending in low-income communities, community development finance sector. Community lenders in the U.S. cover about 70% of their costs. The rest is subsidized by the government. When J.P. Morgan lends in urban Detroit, it's in large part based on state and federal subsidies that they're benefiting from. And so our belief is it's less about whether these types of incentives are appropriate, it's how to do them in the right ways so that it's not political cronyism, there aren't certain regions favored over others, but there's uh, well-informed decisions based on data and really oriented towards impact. Um, so we do believe that the market can become more competitive and efficient. Our goal is that um, over five years, we can reduce the amount of financial incentives or subsidy by half um, in, the, in the East African countries where we're working. But we do believe that some of the smaller ticket sizes, some of the less formal value chains, some of the less served regions, northern Kenya, northern Uganda, um, are going to need ongoing support. And can we build the evidence base that this is a very um, high impact, high leverage, um, and it's an investment uh, and convince um, country governments that, that these are policies that, that they could enact and take over the funding from uh, international donors like USAID. Thank you. Um, I think that's a great point, and I think it actually um, relates to another question that came up from the chat box that asks, you know, donors seem to prefer numbers um, versus the system. And I think, you know, what both of your models are showing is how to combine our need um, from USAID to collect the numbers that allow us to respond to um, Congress with how we're performing with hopefully a model that is um, systemically having an impact. Um, and then I think that is very hard to collect in terms of data. It's very hard to to. Um, especially collect in the beginning, but I wonder if you can speak a little bit more. I think um, we've had some questions come in related to SMEs and um, what the role is in terms of TA for SMEs. Um, and over the life of a project, um, is there a way to scale blended financial services um, to build local capacity to service SMEs? I think you've both touched on it a little bit. Um, so feel free to comment as you like. We've had like three or four questions on this, but I don't know if we have time to get into detail. Um, so maybe maybe Brian first this time. Sure. Yeah. So Aceli has a TA component. We started with earlier stage SMEs. In this case, um, SMEs with revenues of fifty thousand to five hundred thousand dollars. Of course, there's 
a lot of activity below that range, uh, but, but this is our starting point. And we're partnering with a group called Africa Management Institute, which offers a seven month online training curriculum. There's peer to peer learning. Um, we've um, enhanced it with some individualized coaching for the management teams from each of the, the 50 businesses that are participating in this program. And if it goes well, we plan to, to scale that up and reach a couple hundred businesses a year across the four countries. And then also pair it with more individualized technical assistance uh, that can be tailored to the needs of, of specific businesses. So the, um, the, the pilot is at a price point of just under $2,000 per business. Uh, we were thinking about charging businesses for it. Um, in principle, we would like to do that. We felt that in the context of COVID, it, it didn't make sense to, uh, but certainly you know, building up a sustainable market for TA or business development services is critical. And as much as possible, we want to be working with local TA providers um, that have a lower cost structure and can serve the market in, in the long term. What I mean, what we've learned is that this TA is so critical and it has to be provided. I, I question whether or not our incentives alone in Ghana could have provided like, that level of financing without this TA. Uh, another important point to note is that a lot of these programs that we implement are done in very close collaboration with other implementing partners that are working very explicitly on technical assistance to farms and improving their connections to markets and improving their productivity and so forth. So it's critical, right? And so what we do to, to inject, I think, the sustainability into those services is to reduce the amount that we're willing to uh, pay for VAS services over time, right? Between one transaction advisor and one company, uh, we reduce the amount of subsidy that we can provide them to close financing over time. And we also ask that the companies share in the cost of that financing. I think that I mentioned in the chat, the ability of a company to pay for that TA is reduced <laughs> with the size of the company, right? So if you're a, a you know, one-person farmer, uh, you're not able to pay $10,000 fee to a VAS provider to help you get a $1,000 loan or whatever it is. You're not able to, to make those investments. It's actually much lower because the, the, the way that we price those services is, is, ca is capped and it's also linked to the size of the loan. But still, I think at some point, uh, those services become a public good. And we're, we're, in the new program in Ghana, we're trying to work uh, with the mission to figure out exactly at what point do those services become a public good. And we can get the government of Ghana to shift the way that they provide incentives to provide incentives more towards those services instead of the traditional ways. Great. Thanks, Amanda. Um, a specific question that came in, actually, that I think is relevant is um, in terms of the SMEs and getting them prepared to secure guarantees and loans from organizations such as both of yours, um, what metrics do you look for when making a decision on potential borrowers? And this is for either of you. So in the case of the SOE, um we are credit lenders into our program and we give them criteria for loans that they can register with us. And then they go out and underwrite the loans. They use their own capital. They use their own procedures and policies to underwrite those loans. Um, and that's why when I talk about this being a multi-year process, we absolutely see a need for banks in particular to evolve their policies around collateral approvals, interest rates, et cetera. Um, but we're not, um, we can't affect that immediately um, and we're not going to um, intervene at that level to start. Um, so we, we expect that to be a process and to be um, part of the capacity building as well with those institutions. But you know, many times banks have heavy collateral requirements because of how they're regulated by their central bank and by the international accounting standards. So there's a lot of interdependencies and a need to be working on the enabling environment um, in parallel with some of these more direct interventions. In the case of Kenya, I mean, I think uh, you know the, the, some of the team is on the chat, so they can talk about our criteria that we actually use 
uh, and require both financial institutions and VAS providers to select the type of businesses that they're going to work with. So those criteria are set. We develop them in the commission, and they have their things like, you know, uh, potential to reach many smallholders uh, in our target uh, geographies in the sectors that we care about. But the actual decision on which, uh, you know, customer gets a loan or not is really up to the financial institution. We can influence that with the type of training that we provide them and the, the training that we provide in terms of what the risk actually is for lending to these uh, different sectors. And in some cases, we've, in Ghana, we actually, at, at the end of our program, we basically ended up providing some incentives to financial institutions and said, with the caveat, you have to cut a point off your interest rate. <laughs> it worked. I don't know if that was sustainable, but, uh, you know, you, we can influence those decisions, but they're largely up to the financial institutions. And I think as, what we've learned is that as they understand that lending to agriculture is very good business and they're making money at it, they can shift the way that they um, actually decide on, on who to lend to. And that is one of the big you know, goals of these programs. Yeah, great point. Um, we have three minutes left, so I wanted to just ask one last question to Songbei that is kind of for all of us here. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the different roles of subsidies, and Brian, you touched on the role that governments play. Um, USAID kind of plays in all of that space, both policy, um, the PA, structuring um, these transactions, and, and there's a great discussion happening on first loss in the chat box, which we couldn't talk about, but I encourage everyone to take a look at, um, you know, maybe just as a broader question to Sogbe, like, what do you think, it, you know, how do you prioritize this and um, where do you think USAID can play its best, most effective role in supporting actors like Aseli and uh, Kim in order to make sustainable long-term impacts on the market? No, I think, I think, the short answer is continue supporting both of them. Uh, I think one interesting comment that Brian made when we talk about this design is he's really coming from the lender's perspective. Uh, Kim's really coming from the development perspective. And what I think is really valuable, even more than just these dollars, is a, is a discussion like we're having right now. And they're both doing interesting work. I think that we're learning, I'm learning a lot from the work they're doing, and it's really I think one, one part is to really focus on our existing programs. And I think like the, the way that um, Kim has developed from FinGap and is now being um, replicated in, in other countries is a great way that that is progressed and expands. And, and, and similarly, I'd like to see how, um, you know, Aseli uh, and Kim-like programs can be, you know, support each other more directly uh, so we can stay coordinated. But I think they're, they're both valuable and I think they are really, really good examples of the way we're using our money now. The last thing I'll say is, is supporting this kind of evidence base because it's true. We are part of that issue uh, that we, you know, I'm saying now we want to think beyond capital mobilized, but we're the ones that ask for those mobilized dollars because we do need to report that as well. So we understand that a lot of that has to come from us. And I do just want to mention, I think someone from Mix is on the call. They, they have a Agri SME metrics program. Sorry, we did not have a chance to have you talk a little bit about it, but um, Mix Market. Uh, and Scope Insight are also doing a, a project to gather more information about these metrics to help us start building this evidence base. Yeah, thanks. And um, just to close out, I, and I just wanted to flag, I know um, there was a lot of questions we couldn't get to on the chat box. We plan to answer all of them in writing, and that will be on the Market Links website, um, along with the recording of this webinar. Um, and some other announcements. Um, in terms of one of the questions that came up that I think it's important to mention is it was on land tenure and the use of collateral for smallholder farmers. Um, actually, our next principal interest webinar on December 10th at 9 a.m. will be on the role of mobile asset lending and so mobile property lending. And so I think if you're interested in that discussion, please join us on December 10th. Um, please take a look at the poll questions here and answer. It helps us structure and plan for future webinars. We hope to have these once a month um, going forward on the topic of finance. And um, finally, if there are any other questions we could not get to today, please feel free to email us. Um, I think our website is linked here with the finance wiki, and I'll make sure to put our email in here so you can access that. 
Um, but thank you all for joining us today. I think it was a really rich discussion. We probably could have gone on for another half an hour to an hour, um, but I know everyone is short on time and tired of being on uh, calls all day. So I hope you all have a great evening if you're overseas and a great day if you're here in the U.S. Um, and thanks again. And thank you, Amanda, Songbei, and Brian for spending time with us today on this discussion. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.